Hello, 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 everybody, and welcome to a video where I will be answering the question, can draft data be trusted? With Crimson Vow right around the corner, I wanted to know whether or not the data that is collected from the first week of the format can accurately predict the format as a whole. When I talk about draft data, I'm referring to 17lands.com, a site that lets users sign up to track their own draft data, and then 17lands aggregates that data and uses it to provide useful metrics with a large sample size. Before I get to the rest of the video, though, I want to remind you that if you enjoy this video, remember to hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel for more content, and comment below with your questions, thoughts, and feedback. Without further ado, let's dive in. The first number I looked at was the archetype rankings number, so the archetype win percentage. Now, it's important to note with all win percentages you see, they are going to be inflated because the average 17 lands user is uh, more invested in magic than just a typical user, so they tend to win over 50% of their game. So if you see the, like all of these win percentages being higher and wondering how everything adds up to 100%, that's why. It's because they start from a higher baseline than just winning half of their games. But with that little caveat out of the way, we see that the archetype rankings remain relatively stable. So all of the green numbers are the exact same rank order as they were at the beginning of the format and the end of the format. Now, the individual percentages might change, but it's still very useful to be able to say, wow, Azorius and Demir were number one and two at the beginning of the format, and they were number one and two at the end of the format. Similarly, Simic was number three, Selesnya was number four, stayed number three and number four. Now, the red number is the one uh, archetype that really like changed in its order. So black green decks went from the sixth best early on in the format to the eighth best. And then the yellow numbers were the ones that kind of got ripple down effects from the change of the black green deck. So if the black green deck had stayed at the same win percentage from the beginning to the end of the format, then the rank order would have been exactly the same. And so, uh, the black, black, red, and the red, white decks stayed relatively constant in their win percentages. But basically what you can glean from this or what I'm gleaning from this information is that early data can actually provide a relatively accurate projection of how the format is going to shake out as a whole. Now, people are going to figure out how to draft the best archetypes. They're still innovating to be done, but it looks like the power level of the archetypes is relatively easy to determine early in the format. Now, the next thing I wanted to look at was the top 10 commons in the set to see how many of those stayed the same and how many of them like had some general shifts. Now, and looking at the top 10 commons for week one versus the entire format, nine of the 10 top commons stayed in the top commons list. And the only one that did shift out was the number 10 one, Eaten Alive, which got re like replaced by Search Party Captain. Um, and it's just really interesting to note that the, the commons stay the same. So if you look at the week one data and you're trying to figure out which commons are the best, those commons t generally are staying in a relatively stable spot near the top of the standings, and they're not really shifting around or falling out or things of that nature. So that was a really interesting thing to determine. And there is some shifting, like you can see, like Revenge of the Drowned went from number three common to number four common, just according to these win rate numbers, there were some downtrends. Lunark Veteran really jumped up. But overall, you can see a lot of these commons are staying relatively close to where they were before, most of them only shifting around by one or two spots, uh, or not even shifting at all. So pretty interesting there. I then went color by color looking at the top commons to see how those changed. The top five commons in white at the in week one of the format stayed the top five commons in white at the end of the format. Uh, Blessed Defiance and Search Party Captain flip-flopped, but I mean, they all were the same top five commons. In blue, exact five for five match, Falcon Abomination and Flip the Switch switched places but still top five stayed the top five. Black commons, they all stayed, the top five commons stayed the top five. There was a little bit of a flip-flop, um, but they still stayed the same. And then getting to red, four of the top five stayed the same. Famished Foragers actually dropped to number six and Festival Crasher really jumped up. So that was a bit of a like cool find that Festival Crasher was much better than it was at the beginning of the format. It actually, over the course of the rest of the format, really made a big push and got into the top five commons there and uh, Famished Foragers fell as a result. But still, four, of the, four out of the five commons stayed, top commons stayed the same. And honest, honestly, one of the interesting things about this is that Neonate's Rush, which was kind of a surprise to see at the top of the commons list, actually maintained its place at the top of the list. So that was really interesting to see as well. And then green, similar story. Um, Might of the Ways fell out of the top five commons and tapping at the window came into the top five commons. But other than that, perfect match across the board for like the other four. So like Farmer stayed number one, Shadow Beast sighting stayed number two. Uh, and so forth with Harvest Tide Sentry and Duel for Dominance with only one change. So looks like of the 
top five commons for each color that's 25 commons 23 of them stayed in the top five commons and then there was only a couple of flip-flops tapping at the window also maybe a card that took longer to figure out and then one thing that i also wanted to look at was the top mythics because the mythics in general are going to have the lowest sample size uh, of any of the cards and by sample size i mean how many times are people playing with that card so if I'm if I'm opening uh, doing a draft, I might have a couple of each common in the deck, or it's an expectation that there's going to be way more commons played than mythics played. So you can see in the first week of the format, Meat Hook Massacre was only played 1,830 times by players, but over the course of the entire format, it got played 6,435 times. So it got played like three times uh, as much, a little bit more than more than three times as much, around almost four times as much uh, over the course of the entire format. Um, so like between three and four times as much times over the course of the entire format, which is kind of interesting because it not only says that the card like was played significantly more, but also it was kind of by less than I would think because the format was out for like a couple months. And so I would expect it to kind of scale linearly, but it looks like a lot of the games that do get played of a new format get played in the first week. So that could mean that um, the early draft data does kind of carry forward in some sense, but it also just means that people are more excited to draft the new set. Uh, and one of the interesting things about this uh, draft data, even with a smaller sample size where these cards have less than 2,000 like games played with each of them, eight of the 10 top uh, mythics stayed in the top 10 mythics going forward, and only Jaren and Lord of the Forsaken fell out of that top sp uh, couple top 10 uh, with Enduring Angel and Poppets that you're replacing them. So most of the top mythics stay the same, which kind of indicates that even with relatively little data, the numbers kind of can bear out and kind of give you some useful metrics. So that was an interesting thing that I wanted to look at. Instead of looking at the exact win percentage, I just wanted to highlight that even with a small sample size, uh, the like top cards stayed relatively constant. So very interesting to look at as well. So what are some takeaways we can use for Crimson Vow with that draft data that we haven't had access to yet because nobody's been drafting the set? How can we maybe use some of that knowledge that we gain from looking at these things? Because it's interesting to see the comparisons, but if you don't get anything useful to take away, then it was kind of just not really useful at all. So the first thing that I took away from it is that early data is pretty accurate. I mean, the archetype rankings was basically the exact same with the exception of green black the top five commons stayed relatively constant with only two exceptions in that and the top mythics even even with much smaller sample size stayed relatively constant as well so it looks like early data is pretty accurate which means that i'm much less likely to just go oh it's only week one of the format the data isn't going to be giving me anything useful i think you can actually get something useful from the first few days of the format and it actually would be an interesting experiment to see how early you can go so like maybe the first three days of draft data isn't particularly accurate, or like the first day of draft data isn't particularly accurate, by, but by day three it is. So that would be an interesting place to pin down because the earlier you can get that useful data, the better, like the sooner you can start applying it and uh, gaining an edge from knowing like hidden gems and things like that. Another thing is that surprising cards maintain performance. And so a card that really came to mind for me was Neonate's Rush, which when I saw that that was the top common in red, according to the data, I thought that must just be a flash in the pan. People weren't playing around it, or maybe the card just had some random performances where people were like, optimizing the card or it was performing particularly well for some other reason but it looks like it was able to maintain its performance and really shine even going later on into the format same thing with like lunark veteran which was a card that a lot of people did not expect to be particularly good but it stayed as the top white common and things of that nature. and same with blessed defiance which was another white common that didn't look particularly great but that stayed maintained its performance so a lot of the cards that were on those lists that I initially maybe looked at them and thought, wow, that doesn't actually look like a top common, or oh, that card maybe is going to fade as the format goes forward, actually maintained their performance and stayed on that list going forward. So that was a very interesting thing that I could take away from that, where I don't want to let myself get biased by looking at a card from Crimson Vow that is performing well according to the data and just thinking, oh, that's not going to be able to maintain its performance, because it looks like in Midnight Hunt, those cards generally performed well over the course of the entire format. And then another, like the final takeaway is that some cards take longer to figure out. So th with the example of Festival Crasher and Tapping at the Window, those were the two cards that broke into the top commons uh, in red and green respectively. And it looks like Festival Crasher just took a little bit of time for people to really realize how to use it properly. Same thing with Tapping at the Window. Over time, those cards managed to uh, actually shake up the top commons because they maybe weren't 
as powerful on the surface or they were cards that were misused initially and then over time people kind of figured them out and realized how powerful they were so those are just some takeaways that i got from that let me know in the comment section down below what takeaways you got from that data or interesting data you've been looking at or would like to see examined remember to hit that like button to help the video succeed and to let me know that you enjoyed it and want to see more things like this in the future you can also subscribe for more content including crimson vow draft content remember to <laughs> Uh, if you do enjoy this video and wanted to let me know you made it all the way to the end, leave hashtag to data or not to data in the comments section down below. Uh, and yeah, overall, I found this very interesting to look at. I hope you did as well. I hope you enjoyed the video and I will talk to you next time.